As sisters in Zion, we meet regularly to teach and edify one another and to relieve temporal and spiritual suffering through service. Thank you for coming. Now tonight, I have been asked to give a lesson on the practice of polygamy. I pray for guidance and humility in discussing this most delicate of subjects. Polygamy. <laughs> Will the brethren bring polygamy back? That's the question in the back of every contemporary Mormon's mind today. The church may have officially abandoned polygamy in 1890, just before Utah became a state, but the doctrine of polygamy has never been rescinded. When the time comes to practice it again, will you be ready? Although polygamy is currently illegal in America and cause for excommunication within the contemporary Mormon church, some break-off Mormon sects have never abandoned the practice. They're living the principle from Canada to Utah to Mexico. It's estimated that over 50,000 people within the United States are in a polygamous relationship, defined as a man married to more than one woman. There is an undeniable historical, spiritual, socio-economic precedent for polygamy. The Old Testament provides ample evidence that polygamy was acceptable in ancient Israel. Abraham was not the only man with multiple wives. Among others, Jacob had two wives and two concubines. King David had a large harem, and Solomon managed 700 wives and more than 300 concubines. Officially, polygamy's chief purpose is to provide righteous men and women the opportunity to have a numerous and faithful posterity, to be raised up and taught into principles of righteousness and truth. Polygamy provides a way for every Mormon woman to be a wife and mother. Monogamy actually provides immorality. Prostitution and unwed mothers can be prevented in the way the Lord devised in ancient times. That is, by giving to his faithful servants a plurality of wives. There are so many other positive reasons to practice polygamy. Women share the household burdens, raise their children together. Bottom line, my husband taught that God the Father It's part of the plan of salvation. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. Our unions are mirrored in the heavens. To be a God and to have enough wives to provide spirit children for the worlds that we will one day create and that have been created. We cannot enter into the highest degree of heaven, the celestial kingdom, without partaking in the new and everlasting covenant. We are blessed to live in this dispensation of the fullness of times when these truths have come to life. Now those who live the spiritual commandment were not engaging in polygamy as the world understands it. It was not a cultural practice of convenience. It was not a biological phenomena, an excuse to engage in secret sexual adventures to satisfy one's curiosity or libido. It was a deliberate act of obedience to God was a spiritual commandment. We entered into the new and everlasting covenant. Ours were eternal, loving marriages, sealed in this life and the next. It was the holy order of celestial marriage. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't continue with this lesson as planned. I know what the brethren want me to say. I understand what polygamy meant to the early Latter-day Saints and my husband. We can theorize, we can philosophize about it, we can talk about its spiritual and doctrinal importance, but all I know for sure is what I experienced. Has anyone in this room tried to live polygamy? <laughs> well, I have. And I don't want to say that it was horrible, but it was. <laughs> and did you hear the one about the man who was afraid to ask permission of his first wife to practice polygamy? Finally, he told her that he had a revelation to take a young sister so-and-so as a second wife. 
and in the face of such divine instructions, she must give her consent. She announced the next morning that she too had received a revelation during the night. She was to shoot the woman who became his wife. <laughs> he remained monogamous. I like that joke. I'm trying to have a sense of humor about polygamy these days. After all, my whole life seems to be defined by the practice of it, or the unpractice of it. Here I would take off my roof, my ringlets, and all of Victoria and Kutra Khan, revealing a modern woman who's letting her hair down and getting breathed. Do you mind? <laughs> I'm afraid I've outgrown these ringlets and these petticoats this corset and these boots. <laughs> I hate those accoutrements as much as I hated polygamy, or madism, as I've heard some of my contemporaries call it. So, there, I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I've been dead a long time, I have been resurrected to the stage by the pens and the overactive imaginations of two playwrights to tell my whole story. They thought they could get me here by telling me I was going to give the Relief Society lesson of a lifetime. But I can't give a lesson on something I don't believe in. Not anymore. But I can't tell you my story. That's really the only thing we have to give each other is our stories. Now keep in mind that this is just my perspective. And I'll admit I'm biased. <laughs> but history is biased especially when it's written solely by men, particularly Brigham Young, <laughs> the great Mormon colonizer who led the church after my husband was martyred. And no matter what he did to write me out of history, I'm back. Now, I can't examine polygamy without examining myself. Long before I met my prophet husband, I had an unwavering faith. God. I knew how to pray. I believed in miracles. I still do. The miracles of the heart. I'm not concerned with moving mountains and parting seas anymore. <laughs> As a little girl, I would pray in the forest, and my prayers were answered, like the time my father stopped going to church. Father in heaven. Mother says father has gone astray and no longer believes. He says dependence upon you does not plow the fields or spread the tables or satisfy our debt. He won't come to Sunday meetings or pray. Dear father, I know you have power to do all things. Please carve a miracle within my father's stone heart. And if thou wilt do it, I promise thee that I will do whatever thou wilt require me for the rest of my life. Father, I looked up to find my father standing over me with tears in his eyes. He had overheard my prayer. I wrapped my tiny arms around him and hugged him with all my strength. And the next week, he was back in church. He never seemed to doubt again. I always felt it was my duty to save the people I loved. The scriptures say that everyone has a spiritual gift, minus faith. Faith in God, in the scriptures, in his prophets. I can't remember a time when I didn't feel God with me. I knew what the Holy Ghost feels like, that warm burning and the quick thumping of my heart as I listened to my Methodist uncle preach, or my mother read the scriptures. I didn't think it was possible to love God more deeply than I did, until I met Joseph. We were married for 17 years. We were so young when we met. Well, not that young. I was pretty much an old maid when I first met him. I was 21. <laughs> he was a year and a half younger than me. So I was robbing the cradle, sisters. I love Joseph. From the first moment I smelled him. 
My mother and father used to operate a bed and breakfast of sorts, and Joseph and his father were one of our boarders. My father had actually hired Joseph to locate buried treasure, believed to be on our property in Pennsylvania. And it's, it sounds strange now that everyone was looking for buried treasure back then. And Joseph had a reputation for being good at money digging, as folks called it. He would use divining rods and peep stones to locate treasure, and then they dig and dig and dig. Of course, they didn't find any treasure, but I found mine. I used to come home from teaching school to help my mother prepare dinner. I was still setting the table when Joseph came in early. We hadn't met. I didn't even know his name yet. From the kitchen doorway, I could see his broad shoulders, the firm outline of his muscles under his work shirt. His hair was disheveled and crazy, all these cowlicks with a life of their own. He seemed very at home in his own body, very self-assured. As I was putting the biscuits on the table, I bumped into him. There are no accidents. And the whole plate of biscuits fell into his lap. And without thinking, I bent down to grab the warm biscuits, and just in time, I realized what it must look like I was reaching for in his lap, <laughs> and stopped myself, concentrating on the mess below his chair instead. I, his boots were muddy and manly. I was close enough to see the stains under his armpits and the bead of sweat in the hairs on his forearms. They were veined and muscular. That's when I smelled him. <laughs> Even his smell was righteous. <laughs> he smelled of pine and dirt and then sun and a hard day's work in that big hole in the ground. I couldn't look up. And people talk about a moment suspended in time, and that's what it was. I knew that if he looked as good as he smelled, <laughs> I looked up. And I saw his eyes, blue, like no blue I'd ever seen before, with flecks of gold and green and hazel near the pupil. People always talked about his eyes. And right then, his eyes were laughing. He laughed so hard, he almost choked. And he wasn't laughing with me. He was <laughs> laughing at me. But not in a mean way. He bent down to help me pick up the biscuits. I didn't dare touch him again, even accidentally. I had to get away from the table. My face was burning. I, I felt this hard lump of longing for him in the pit of my stomach, and it, it scared me. Have you ever felt that? It's almost animal, like, like you have to have him. All of it, forever. And your mind starts planning a million ways every day that you can coincidentally bump into him again and casually toss off a witty comment that you've obsessed over for hours. He caught me looking and winked. <laughs> and I winked back. <laughs> I never wink. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the end, as they say. He just had to look at me with those eyes. And I couldn't refuse him anything. No one could wink like a prophet. We became friends and confidence. Our courtship consisted of long walks and heated discussions. Joseph. I consider myself as righteous as you, and I have pled for revelation, for direct proof, and I have received no answers. I don't doubt the power of the Lord to communicate to modern man, but I trust no man who claims to have received that personal visitation. If someone I knew claimed to have received such a visitation, I should first consider their personal integrity. Then, I should listen attentively. For if such communication had happened, my world would be 
change to pray. And lastly, I would seek out the Lord in prayer. Because I do believe that every man or woman is entitled to their own revelation. And that the Lord does affirm truth from whatever unlikely source. Baby, grab me and you kissed me. <laughs> no one could kiss like the prophet. <laughs> <laughs> through, through Joseph, I began to feel God love me beyond my wildest imagination. Then, Joseph told me an impossible story. He had seen the angels. He told me of a personal visitation of God the Father and his son Jesus Christ to him as a boy of 14. They had appeared to him when he was praying in the woods. He spoke of a restoration of Christ's church upon the modern world through himself as God's spokesperson. Of a golden book deposited in a nearby hillside giving an account of the ancient inhabitants of this continent containing the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Joseph said that he was called to translate it he was a prophet, a latter-day Samuel. The golden plates would only be entrusted to him when he had found the right person to aid him. He said, that was me. He said, I had been raised to be his helpmeet. With my support, he could and would accomplish everything the Lord had commanded. The Spirit bore powerful witness to me that what he said was true. This is a restoration of Christ Church, not a reformation. The heavens were still open. God spoke to prophets then and now. Truth was restored. Truth was expanded. There was no need for an intermediary between myself and God. And we on the frontier knew that instinctively. We didn't live near the cathedrals of Europe. The trees were our steeples. The sun rays and the leaves through our, the, the sun rays through the leaves were our stained glass. I understood from the outset that marrying Joseph was marrying his gods. Like the ancient Israelite women, I would be renouncing the gods my fathers had honored for a new gospel, a new understanding of the heavens. I had no premonition how difficult it would be to live with the Lord's mouthpiece. He was a young man full of the Spirit. He glowed from within with the further light and knowledge his heavenly messengers had entrusted to me. I saw Joseph only as a man who wanted me. So we eloped. I married the choice of my heart and moved to his parents' home in upstate New York. I don't want to take credit away from Joseph for organizing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I think it would be hard to imagine so many founding elements without naming me right beside him. My husband received a revelation from the Lord that I should make our first hymn book. I felt it was a sacred honor to do so. For my soul delighted in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me. Joseph loved my singing. I first started singing in my uncle's Methodist choir as a little girl. And one of the earliest revelations recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants was addressed to me. Section 25, Emma Smith, my daughter. A revelation I give unto you concerning my will. If thou art faithful and walk in the paths of virtue before me, I will preserve thy life, and thou shalt receive an inheritance in Zion. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee. Thou art an elect lady whom I am called. I love that part. Ugh, pressure to be elect all the time. <laughs> murmur not. Now, I never murmur. I might scream and throw things. I might lock Joseph out of the bedroom, but I never murmur. <laughs> <clears throat> murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world, which is wisdom in me for a time to come. Now, that passage refers to the golden plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated. I never saw the golden plates. 
but I felt them. I was Joseph's first scribe. I believe Joseph Smith to be everything he professed to be. He didn't write the Book of Mormon. He translated it by the gift and power of God. And Joseph couldn't write a coherent letter, let alone the Book of Mormon. Once, when he was translating from the Reformed Egyptian, a reference was made to the walls of Jerusalem. Joseph stopped. Did Jerusalem have walls surrounding it? He asked me. Yes. <laughs> I told him it did. Oh, I thought I was deceived, he said. So I never saw the place, not in plain view, but I know they existed. They lay in a box under our bed for months. But I didn't dare look at them. I promised Joseph that I wouldn't. While cleaning the house, I felt the plates as they lay on the kitchen table draped under a white tablecloth. I traced their outline and their shape. They were pliable like thick paper, and they rustled with a metallic clinking sound when I moved the edges with my thumb, like you thumb the pages of a book. They were heavy. Joseph strained when he lifted them, and he was a strong man, so I'd say they must have weighed at least 50 pounds. I could tell you stories about how we did them over and over from people trying to steal them. You can imagine what they would be worth today. The hiding places changed daily. A fallen log in the forest, a barrel of beans, secret compartments under floorboards and fireplaces, barn lofts, but the Lord always helped us keep them safe. What they contained was more precious than gold more precious than the gold they were engraved upon. I say, thank heavens that the Lord took them back. <laughs> it made my life a whole lot easier. <clears throat> and the office of thy calling shall be for a comfort unto my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., thy husband, in his afflictions, with consoling words, in the spirit of meekness. And thou shalt go with him at the time of his going. I would have followed my husband to the ends of the earth. I did. Nine moves in 17 years. From my parents' home in Pennsylvania to upstate New York, Ohio, to the outer frontier of Missouri, and then back across the Mississippi to Nauvoo, Illinois, the city of Joseph. And if he had gone to the Rocky Mountains, I would have gone there too. I love to serve the saints. I took my position as head of the Relief Society very seriously. Our motto was and is, charity never fail. We did everything possible to love and serve the less fortunate among us. There were times when malaria swept through the town and, and the sick filled every bed in my house, spilling over onto makeshift bedrolls outside. Joseph and I would sleep in a tent. I felt humbled to work among such noble mothers in Zion. And there was so much to do for the building up of the kingdom of God on earth. So many opportunities to serve, a temple to be built, an angelic manifestations, speaking in tongues, baptisms of wire and water and fire, and thousands of saints arriving weekly from Europe and Canada, from all over the eastern states. Even the Native Americans were joining. The spirit was intoxicating. The velocity at which the work progressed was exhilarating, and the future never looked more splendid. All of our earthly, earthly endeavors had a fixed, eternal gaze. And my husband knew how to have fun. <laughs> Though headed to heaven, we stopped for dancing, for music, and he loved to play with children. He was a prophet among prophets at the podium. He was a worker among the workers in the field. He was a lover among lovers. <laughs> Which is what brings us here tonight. <laughs> when Joseph first hinted that polygamy, that the practice of polygamy was to be introduced into the church, I was disgusted. But if we were truly living in the dispensation of the fullness of times, embracing all other dispensations and truths, then it made sense that polygamy might also be restored. 
I deluded myself with the idea that polygamy's application was far in the future, that I would never have to deal with it. But I had been dealing with it. Unbeknownst to me, in 1941, he took three wives. In 1942, he added 11 more. <clears throat> In 1983, 14 women were sealed to my husband. Historians debate the total number, but between 22 and 66 women were sealed to him while he was living, and another 149 women posthumously. Remember that wink I talked about? Obviously, it wasn't just for me. Joseph winked at others, too. I can't say I personally saw him wink at others, but I know when I stopped winking back. <clears throat> March, 1832, Kirtland, Ohio. We had adopted twins, Julia and Joseph Murdoch, when our own biological twins, Thaddeus and Louisa, had died. The living twins were recovering from measles, and Joseph lay with baby Joey in one room while I slept with little Julia in another. As it so often happened, we were temporarily displaced and relying upon the hospitality of strangers, specifically our friends the Johnsons. Suddenly, the front door burst open. A dozen men in blackened faces grabbed Joseph out of bed, kicking and struggling. The mob of 50 or so men outside overpowered him and staggered into the yard with, with Joseph. Unnoticed, baby Joey fell to the floor in their frenzy, nearly trampled under their feet. I grabbed both babies and ran to the barn to hide. Rape was common on the frontier, and violating the Mormon prophet's wife would certainly have been something to boast about. I watched from between a crack in the barn as they grabbed Joseph by the throat and choked him into unconsciousness. They stripped him of all his clothes, then pulled him spread eagle on the ground. God damn me, that's the way the Holy Ghost falls on folks. One screamed while the other spit on him. They jammed a tar paddle in his mouth. Someone forced a vial of poison between his lips, but he bit down on the glass and it shattered, breaking one of his front teeth. They scratched him with their bare nails, poured tar over his head, and then smeared it down his body and rolled him in feathers. I heard the drunken men urge a doctor forward, and they began to primarily chant, castrate, 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 castrate. <sighs> Why? What could Joseph have done to enrage these men to the point that they would do such a, a barbaric thing? Were we Mormons such an economic and political threat? And then I saw Eli Johnson's face reflected in the torchlight the teenage son of the family that we were staying with. And I caught bits and pieces of his insults under the mob's guttural chaos. Fornicator. Deviant. Seduce my sister. What was he talking about? Nothing improper had happened with his sister Miranda. <laughs> the crowd ran and dispersed when a gunshot was heard from the barn. I had fired the gun. When Joseph staggered back in, naked and half frozen, I mistook the tar on his body for blood and nearly fainted. All that night, I scraped off the tar and feathers with lard and kerosene. And his skin would come away too. The cuts split wider. His men had been very purposeful with the tar concentrating on his most vulnerable and private parts. It was an intimate and delicate surgery, and Joseph only wanted me to touch him. With each scrape, I cradled his head and whispered reassurances of safety that I didn't feel. This is the weakest I had ever seen him. He kept his blue eyes closed as the tears fell with the blood, moaning softly to himself. I thought I heard him whimper, Say it. 
church, in the presence of those who had assaulted him the night before, he preached a sermon on forgiveness that was so pure and powerful that some of the mob members even converted. Huh. I never asked exactly what he had done. Nothing. Probably. Not all truth needs to be told. What good is repentance if a sin cannot be truly confessed, forgiven, forsaken? I was confident that Joseph would never make the same mistake twice. Baby Joseph died six days later from exposure to the cold. I have known for my composure. 
I'd hold my face frozen with just this twitching under my right eye to give me away and barely make it to my bedroom before I would, before the waves would crush me into a corner, crumpled in a ball of anger and rage and resentment and sadness. I would bite the fleshy part of my hand to silence the sobs because the walls were so thin and then wear gloves to hide the marks. Am I unworthy to raise a living child? What did I do wrong? What sin did I commit? What must I do to prove my worthiness to you, Lord? Make me an instrument in thy hands. Trust me with thy children. Men process grief in different ways. <clears throat> Baby Joseph's need for children, wives, posterity was his way of managing the grief and assuring a legacy of living descendants. <clears throat> Time and prayer and service were my medications. I served as a midwife. I knew what it was like to have difficult labors and lose babies. And I cared for those women the way I wish someone would have cared for me. Some of my dearest memories are of the childbirth blessings that we would give each other. There's nothing like it. A sister's touch and blessing.
not move. We flourished. Finally, I had a home. I had two healthy sons. Joseph built me the mansion house, which also served as a hotel. The temple was begun. Joseph was the mayor and chief architect of a city that rivaled Chicago in our time. He ran for president to establish a theocracy that would replace the evils of a failing democratic government. I was laid to bed after the birth of Frederick, my third son. My pregnancies and labors were always difficult, but this time, thankfully, my recovery was faster than usual. <clears throat> so I was up and about after the third day, third or fourth day. I went to the barn to gather some eggs for breakfast and heard a sound I knew intimately. It was Joseph, and he wasn't alone. recognize his sound and her giggle. It was Fanny. Fanny was 17. She'd lived with us for the last six months. I thought of her as my daughter. She'd help me with the laundry and the cooking and the child care. I had a pretty clear vision of what was happening behind that door just from the sounds, but I would never know for certain what was going on unless I looked. I peeped through a crack in the barn door and saw I packed my bags and the children's things. I was ready to return in disgrace and ridicule to my parents' home rather than share his bed. I knew it would bring shame upon him and the church, but I couldn't remain in that house. He caught me packing the last bag. He would look me in the eye. And then I realized he was crying. In one swift lunge, he fell to his knee, grabbing me around the waist and burying his face in my belly, still tender from the birth. My own, the choice of my heart, don't leave me. My beloved, affectionate Emma, please, please. How could I not forgive this man? The spirit prodded me to forgive Joseph, but I ignored the promptings. I wanted to hurt him first. I pried his fingers from around my knees. I grabbed his face in my shaking hands and said with as much venom as I could manage, and you, a man of God, it is a dirty, nasty, filthy affair, and it will cost you everything. Joseph offered no defense. He was caught. He confessed humbly. He begged forgiveness. Once again, I forgave him. But a seed had been planted in more ways than one. I started to doubt Joseph. I gave more credit to the rumors that had followed us from state to state. I had been so firm in his defense, but now I re-examined every whisper. I studied his every look every small and natural kindness that he gave so easily and charmingly to the ladies. Every woman became my rival. I told Joseph I forgave him, but I stopped winking back. And he would reinvent the heavens in order to win me back. It was around that time that Joseph first introduced the concept of polygamy to a few select friends, not to me. But the concept began to be debated in secret among the brethren, and some began to practice it in tandem with Joseph. I couldn't believe that any self-respecting woman would ever agree to such an arrangement. 
Women weren't commodities to be numbered and sold. It was insulting as well as repulsive to me. And besides, Joseph reassured me that when and if polygamous marriages or sealings, as we call them, were reinstated, that the unions would be celestial only, that the men would have no earthly marital relationships with their multiple wives. The subsequent women would be sealed for eternity, but they were not to live with a man or have his children. In other words, no sex. <laughs> I begged the Lord that I not be put to this test. The rumors and public accusations persisted. In denial, I devoted entire Relief Society meetings to the sub subjects of chastity and virtue and integrity and honesty, completely unaware that my entire presidency or their daughters were already sealed to my husband. One day I was moving Joseph's coat from the hall where he always dropped it to its peg behind the back door. I would always check his pockets for change and receipts and candies that he sometimes bring the children. And I found two small notes wrapped in ribbons with an unfamiliar smell. I always wear lavender or lilac perfume, but these letters smelled like roses. I recognized the handwriting as Eliza's, my closest friend. I was intimidated by Eliza's intelligence, her beauty, her unquestioning faith. Deft and articulate, she was a woman of insight and spiritual power. I had called her as my secretary in the Relief Society. The hymn book that I compiled had several of her hymns. She had been living with us while homeschooling my children. I, I might sus suspect Joseph, but never modest, pious Eliza. One night I went to bed early. Joseph came upstairs to say good night and said our prayers. And as he left, I started to close my bedroom door behind him. And I saw Eliza watching from down the hall. I waved good night to her, asked did Joseph, and then I shut my door. I had almost gotten comfortable under the covers when I remembered something hilarious that one of our sons had said. And I knew Joseph would get a good laugh out of it. So I opened the bedroom door and saw the two of them in her doorway. Joseph's hands were cradling her face. He kissed her eyelids, and then her lips whispered something in her ear. She laughed softly. She gently kissed his hand, and she placed it on her stomach. my eyes, because he said that no one saw the world quite like I did. He used to touch my secret swollen belly when no one but us knew I was pregnant. That was our secret code! Our secret! In five seconds I had seen him give away two of my most private gestures to her! I, what happened next, I'm not completely sure. So many emotions hit me. Shock, denial, betrayal. I felt a rage so intense that it seemed to radiate from my hands and face. And I wanted to hurt them. I don't know what I would have done if I had reached her, torn the hair from her head, ripped those earrings from her ears, slapped her silly stroke face. But as I rushed at her, Eliza backed away. And before I could reach her, she stumbled over the rug at the head of the staircase and fell backwards. I heard her bones hit each wooden corner of the stairs and banister. I closed my eyes, hoping for the worst. She'd be dead, out of our lives forever. I opened my eyes to see her crumpled unconscious at the foot of the stairs. Joseph looked up at me with a look of such accusation. He called my 
my name and reality returned. The dam of my anger cracked and I broke into repentant sobs. Ran to my room, locking the door behind me as Joseph ran to her aid. Eliza left the house that evening. And our correspondence after that was civil but so I wish Wives, 
my dearest, closest friends, my counselors in the Relief Society. I'm so jealous, not only of their relationship with my husband, but of their incredible conversion experiences. How disgusted they were with the concept at first, but then after fervent prayer, they each had these amazing spiritual confirmations that they should accept Joseph's proposals, that it was the Lord's will. Of course, who wouldn't want to marry the prophet? If I love one doctrine from the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, it is that every man and woman is entitled to their own revelation. There is no intermediary between me and my God. My answers to previous prayers had always confirmed that fact. So I studied the issue out in my mind. I tried to keep my personal jealousies at bay. I tried to inquire with an open mind. I wanted to live my life with the Lord's approval. Then I hit the door with all my might and forced my way in. 
The bed and the room were in shambles. Emily cowered in a corner, holding the bed sheets around herself. And my husband stood defiantly in his nightshirt, boldly asking me my business. His nightshirt was inside out. How blind and deaf do you think I am? How stupid! How the saints must laugh at me, the last one, I'm sure, to know that all the rumors are true. You will give them up, Joseph. This is my last ultimatum. All of them. Not just Eliza and Emily, but all the other whores I know as sisters who would betray me to assure themselves salvation in the life to come. You will give up all your wives for me, or blood will flow. Maybe yours, maybe theirs, maybe mine. But I would rather die than be insulted and polluted by your actions. Do not couple me again, Joseph! I will get a divorce and leave you! I will shame you in front of the saints as your wife and head of the Relief Society that you created and preach against you with all of my might, and not just from the church pulpit. I will talk to any newsman or reporter who will listen and publicly rid the church of this diseased doctrine. Joseph agreed to everything I asked of him. He shook hands with both girls in front of me, breaking the contract, and they left my house. My understanding was that it was all over. But his conformity came with a price. I felt Joseph drift farther and farther away from me. We were civil, we shared the same table, but not the same bed. I missed his discussions, our discussions, as much as I missed his touch. He said he couldn't function as a leader without me by his side. He said he couldn't function as a man without me in my, me in his bed, but I couldn't, I wouldn't accept that re revelation. I spent hours and tears begging Joseph to reapproach the Lord on this subject. After all, in previous times, Joseph had reapproached and reapproached and reapproached the Lord on different subjects, and sometimes the Lord had changed his mind. I reasoned with Joseph that whether of divine origin or not, polygamy was a cancer to the saints and was ruining the church. Finally, Joseph agreed. With tears of his own and his arms wrapped tightly around me, he begged me to burn the revelation itself, saying that he regretted its very existence. I would touch that thing with tongs. After the damage it had done to our marriage and our community, I wanted nothing to do with it. Or the blame that I knew would be assigned to me for its repudiation. Joseph lit the match himself. We watched the paper curl and blacken in the hurt until the last fragments floated up in the draft. My heart rejoiced. Oh, finally, the peace descended. He was mine. He was mine, all mine again. I covered his face in kisses and thanked him over and over. And I thought that was the end of it. And then he was murdered. Martyr. And I died too, for a while long after the saints were driven out of Illinois and fled to Utah along the Mormon Trail, the Brigham Trail. I think a part of me had thought that he was in war. He'd emerged triumphant through every trial before. He'd escaped death over and over again. A part of me knew he would get himself shot sooner or later. I sometimes think I killed him. I created such a fuss over polygamy, rallied all the women to my side, fanned the flames of public uproar. When a newspaper 
published an article exposing all of his suspected liaisons, Joseph ordered the printing press destroyed. As if running for a United States president wasn't enough, that set off a public indignation which led to his imprisonment at Carthage Jail, where he was mobbed by his enemies and shot dead. I was five months pregnant. <laughs> I had been betrayed by my closest female friends. I trusted no one. I had no place to go at home. And no friend but the Lord. Brigham Young disputed the ownership of the very house I lived in. Joseph had left no will. <laughs> All church debts were in his name. And as his widow, I now owed over $2 million by today's standards to various creditors. Brigham Young generously awarded me my widow's might. I was left my household goods, two horses, two cows, my spinning wheels, and $124 a year to support my family. I finally realized that no one would protect my children's interests except me. But Joseph had left clear instructions to the next prophet, or so all of them claimed. <laughs> now everyone was vying to become the prophet. Many claimed to possess the prophetic mantle and right to lead the church. And I was too tired to fight. Too tired to listen, too tired to take sides. I had suffered so much for Joseph, for the church, for the gospel, for the saints. I had earned a little rest. All I wanted to do was take care of my children. Above all, I would not lose this last child. Let the men haggle over heaven. I had an angel to attend to. There's not 
one public statement endorsing polygamy that can be traced back to Joseph. Everyone was sworn to secrecy. The saints will stand behind me. It's my word against the brethren. Polygamy will not overshadow everything I've worked and sacrificed for. I began it. I can finish it. I can annihilate the memory of polygamy forever. And when my sons are grown, the Lord will call them to leave the church. It is a sin, but I will bear the burden of deceit. I will stand accountable. It's better that one doctrine should perish than that a whole people dwindle in unbelief. Someday, when I've gathered strength, I will confront those other wives. How could you? Shame on you all. Especially you, Eliza. Not for obeying the Lord's command, but for lying to me about it. I would never have done it to you.
no such thing as polygamy or spiritual wifery was taught publicly or privately before my husband's death that I have now or ever had knowledge of. Did he not have wives other than yourself? I was his first and only wife. He did not have improper relations with any woman that ever came to my knowledge. At one time, my husband came to me and asked me if I had heard certain rumors about spiritual marriage or anything of the kind, and assured me that if I had, they were without foundation, that there was no such doctrine, and never should be, with his knowledge or consent. My eldest living son, Joseph Smith III, became the first prophet of the reorganized church reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, today known as the Community of Christ. My youngest son served a proselyting mission to the saints in Utah, attempting to convert them to the true, to the true Mormonism that I had taught him, which vehemently denied polygamy. He was a charismatic and sensitive leader. Not only could he speak in tongues, he could compose lyrics and compose and, and accompany himself on the piano as led by the Spirit. The auditoriums were filled with saints eager to see Joseph's grown son and listen to the singer of Israel, as they called him, preach. But the Utah Mormons, in turn, tried to convert the direct descendants of the founder of their faith. My David never knew his father. But he met his father's polygamous wives. He met the brethren who had performed their ceilings. He learned the truth. His mother was a liar. And two versions of his father couldn't exist simultaneously within David's mind. Either truth, truth was simple. Either polygamy was of the devil, and his father had no part in it, or polygamy was a commandment from God, openly practiced by his father, and denied by me. Either way, Joseph and I were exposed as people of contradiction. And David was a man of absolutes. My son of promise, Went insane. <clears throat> Brain fever. He thought he was a world renowned architect redesigning America's railway systems. He became convinced that his devoted wife Clara was unfaithful. He was violent, especially towards women. He was institutionalized in 1877 at the Northern Illinois Hospital and Asylum for the Insane in Elgin, Illinois. I spent the last two years of my life trying to reach my son in a fantasy world that even the gospel couldn't compete with. David never regained his sanity. He died in the asylum after 27 years of was my greatest sorrow, my living, festering trouble of conscience, conscience. Guilt was my daily companion. Two weeks before my death, I decided it was time to amend one particular relationship. I called my husband, Vitamin, and, his, and my housekeeper, his mistress, Nancy, into my room. And for once in my life, I faced the difficult truth and embraced it. I acknowledged their love for one another, and I gave them my blessing, or rather my instructions, <laughs> that they marry one another after my death and give their bastard child an honor of 
married and stayed married for 11 years until Vitamin died. A short time later, I had a dream. Joseph came into my bedroom as I slept and gently awakened me with a kiss as he pulled back the covers. He told me that he had a surprise waiting and that I was to get my shawl and my bonnet and follow him. I did so and we left my bedroom holding hands. Joseph was as magnificent as ever. His skin was warm. His eyes were twinkling. All the animosity and foul feelings between us were forgotten. Only the joy and comfort of each other's company remained. I looked down at our hands, intertwined and at the brown and the brown age spots on my hands were gone. I was young again, as my husband softly said, come with me. The front door opened into a beautiful street lined with lilacs, my favorite, blowing in the breeze. It was a mild spring morning, and the smell reached us in waves as we strolled arm in arm. We approached a magnificent mansion of light, which I recognized as my own, as he <coughs> and he winked as he led me up the path. Once inside, my heart began to quicken as I heard the gurgling laugh of a child from a far room and recognized it as baby Don Carlos. I rushed through the rooms until I found him, standing upright in the cradle, reaching for me. I swooped him up in my arms and kissed every inch of his soft, warm skin. He smelled like sour milk and sunshine. I buried my face in his soft neck folds, overcome with the joy of reunion. <laughs> he wiped my tears away and played with my hair and my cheeks, opening his mouth to give me those wet baby kisses. <laughs> and Joseph wrapped us both in his arms. When suddenly I remembered my other babies, and with Don Carlos on my hip, I began to leave the room to search the house for them too. Alvin, my firstborn, the twins, Thaddeus and Louisa, poor Joseph Murdoch, and stillborn baby Isaac. And Joseph held me back, saying that soon they would all be mine. If I could just be patient, I would have them in my arms to fondle and love. And then we entered another room. Joseph gently took the sleeping child from my arms. He turned. And there stood the Savior. He held out his arms to me with such compassion, such love. I clasped his nail marked hands and looked into his eyes and understood immediately through every fiber of my being that he understood my struggles, that he loved me, that my sins had been forgiven, and that a place by his side had been prepared. <laughs> he held our small family in his arms, and finally, <sighs> I felt peace. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, I have much to attend to on the other side of the bay. After all I have shared with you, I don't know how you will judge me or my husband or his wives. I only know that that I have no right to judge you. Thank God. We have it.
eternity to share our stories and continue our friendship.